turn everything on here. Because some folks are having a hard time here this morning and I uh, want to make sure that that's not the case this afternoon. My, uh, my dear old dad used to say uh, that I had a voice like a foghorn. <laughs> so I'll try to live up to that today. You can actually probably draw it back just a little bit, Carrie. Now don't let the uh, fact that that uh, sign-up sheet is on a BC Lions insignia blanket back there be a discouragement to y'all. Yeah. I know being a stamps guy, you know, I kind of looked at it. Oh, bombers. Oh, I forgot, we got peggers in the audience. We got peggers in the audience. Well, I do appreciate that everybody came for the afternoon. You know, it's hard sometimes to sit through an afternoon service after you've eaten a big lunch. So I said that uh, I'd wait till I saw two or three heads start to bob and then I'll just quietly shut down and let you all go to sleep. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today we're going we're gonna to have a look at uh, a passage in scripture that I, I believe is probably one of the most misappropriated scriptures in, in the entirety of the Bible. It's John 3.16 and uh, we all know it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, perish but have everlasting life. And unfortunately it is misappropriated and it would seem on the surface that it is a catch-all statement and it is often read as just a singular statement. Hopefully what we'll see today is that it is kind of two parts irrespective it seems uh, and it's used in the context of uh, you know on the outside I'm talking about outside of the Church of God that irrespective of one a one's actions that God in effect donated his only begotten son to bail out pretty much anybody irrespective of their actions and irrespective of sin and that the offer of salvation might come with no strings attached but is that actually what John 3.16 is saying. Can we read it as a singular statement? And as with many pet scriptures that people cling to, there is a failure on the behalf of many would-be uh, would Christians and, and, and readers. There's a failure to read the actual entirety of the scripture. I always like to encourage people, read, read a few verses ahead, read a few verses behind. Very little of what we read and what we've been taught over the years exists inside of one scripture only. And I would submit that Satan does relish the idea of people kind of going off on a tangent, reading things one way, hanging their hat, hat on a particular scripture or two, and thinking that that's all that's required of us. As part of what we're here to do and look forward to is separating ourselves from the world. That's what we're doing here today. We're separating ourselves from the world. And we are definitely trying to become something that is recognizable to God and that God wants to recognize. And I say because within John 3.16, I do believe lies the underlying will of God for his people and for all that he has created. It outlines his mercy. It speaks to his will. Not only his will for us, but also what he was in fact willing to do for those who would choose life. And for those that would endeavor to become part of his family. Because we have our part to play. It is not a situation of no strings attached. So let's read it. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we will see here that there's more to the context that this is written in, and this scripture does in fact not stand alone. So we'll back up a little bit. If we look at John 3, we begin in verse 1. And we begin reading a conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus Christ. In verses 1 and 2, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came, by, came to Jesus by night. I have to put my glasses on, forgive me. And said unto him, Rabbi, 
We know that thou art teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. So right here we see that Nicodemus realizes who he's dealing with. He understands where Christ has come from. Now, God is with him. And God is in him. Verse 3, says, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And here we kind of see what Nicodemus is, is looking for. And I, I think it's interesting to notice that in verse 3, Jesus begins to answer Nicodemus and answer his query before he actually articulates a question. Jesus Christ knew what he was looking for. Carrying on in verse 4, it says, Nicodemus says to, said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Again, Jesus Christ answers him. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And already we see taking shape a means by which people have to separate themselves. Being born of the water and of the Spirit start to put away our ideals of the physical aspects of, of life in general and to be baptized. Verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And he tells him, Marvel not that I said unto you that you have to be born again. The wind blows where it will. You hear the sound, but you can't tell where it's coming or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered him and he says, How can these things be? So up to this point we read of a man who has come to question how he can actually come to a greater understanding. He's on a search. He's on a journey. Same as the rest of us. We're searching. We're on a journey. He wants to come to a greater understanding of how to have a relationship with God. And it indicates a need for a transformation in man. As I submit, Christ did not die so that we could have religion. He died so that we could have an enhanced and closer relationship with our Father. It runs much deeper. It runs much deeper. So an example is emerging of someone who wants to set himself from the norm of the society that he knew. Notice that he had to sneak out at night to go see him, to go see Christ. He knew what kind of trouble he'd be in. So in the following verses leading up to verse 16, Christ begins to open the door to Nicodemus. And in first he, he begins by challenging him regarding his lack of understanding about spiritual concepts. And we'll see that in verses 10 and 12. And then by confirming who he is, where he came from, and beginning to outline God's intent for mankind via Christ's very presence on the earth. And then in verse 15 we'll see where it articulates the concept of, of believing and what that actually means. And believing in Christ as a forerunner to the salvation that we see in life in God's kingdom. So let's carry on in John 3, verse 10. Says Jesus answered and said unto him, Are you a master of Israel and you know us not these things? So he's challenging him. You don't know this stuff? You're supposed to be a leader of Israel. You don't know this stuff? But verily, verily, I say unto you, We speak that what we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Kind of puts a dart in that whole going to heaven thing. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so much the Son of Man is lifted up. And whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And here we see that first instance of outlining, believing in Jesus Christ. And then we land on the scripture at hand. John 3.16 For 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think that Nicodemus is not the only one getting instruction here. I think this was written for us. Pretty confident in that. But who was God talking about when he says he loved the world? Make no mistake. God is no fan of what the world has become. The derision that we see, the wars we see, the dishonesty, man's inability to deal with, in a proper godly manner with sexuality, coming to the surface in all of our governments, especially Alberta where we put the NDP in. <laughs> but the world that he once created was definitely something that he loved. In the creation narrative, everything that he made, everything that's in our known universe, he consecrated as something that he loved, something that was good. And he did love, and does love, his crowning achievements. That's the world and man. But unfortunately, due to Satan's influence, man put distance between himself and his creator. And that distance is there due to God's righteousness and man's sin. It does not mean, however, that he stopped loving or having the best interests for man at heart. So let's have a look at what the description of the term world means. Word there is the Greek word cosmos. Cosmos. And here it's, it's referring to the world, the universe, the inhabitants of earth, the human family, the ungodly multitude, this is coming out of the, uh, the Strong's, you know, it says the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men, alienated from God, and therefore hostile to the cause of Jesus Christ. And it says even obstacles to the cause of Jesus Christ. But we'll see here that none of God's beneficence is in any way in an indicator that he approves of the conduct of sinful men. Rather, it's a, a revelation of his nature that irrespective of man's evil, uh, evil ways and enmity towards him, he does maintain benevolent feelings for mankind. And he does desire our happiness. And he is sincerely devoted to helping us make a success out of life. But we have to avoid the pitfalls. They are there. They do exist. First John 5.19. You don't have to turn there, but we know that scripture. It says, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. Man is unable to extricate himself from that fact. So therefore, God's solution there is to give a blessing, a gift. Something by which the sins of humanity can actually be redeemed, can be paid. Because we know in Romans 5, 8, again, you don't have to turn there for time, but these are scriptures that we all know pretty well. It says that God uh, commended his love towards us, that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Backed up by Revelation 13, 8. Which at the end of it, it reads, you know, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So God knew what he was dealing with when he put man on the earth. He knows who we are, and sadly what we're capable of in some instances. But we need to remember that we too came out of that same world. It's by no great feat of our own that mercy is offered to us. It's nothing that we have done, it's a gift. The same mercy is actually offered to all of mankind. So, so many of man, uh, people on the earth just will not allow God to do his work. In them. And I think sometimes we find that as a shortcoming of our own, that we don't allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. Because I, I don't think that you're going to find any greater kindness than that that the Father extends towards us. And I think the scripture, 
it does. It sets out a, a clear standard and pattern for conduct for us to exemplify in our lives so that we too can be recognized by God or become something that God wants to recognize. Jesus gave up everything. Everything. With the hope of redeeming us. Now we have to notice that, however, that this verse says, whoever believes in him should have everlasting life. There's two statements in John 3.16. There is the whole world, and there are those who believe in him. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Because Jesus Christ did not sacrifice, or give him up, himself up to sacrifice, just because we were there. He didn't do it that way. He did it, though, for those out of the whole world who would believe in him. And that's the second half of John 3.16 there, and 15 before it. Because while God may love the world and want the best, salvation through Christ's sacrifice is offered to those who believe. And it's only through Jesus Christ. And we can back that up with Acts 4 and verse 10 through 12. It says, Be it known unto all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. And they were speaking of an impotent man who had just been healed. This is a stone which was set at not of your builders, which has become head of the corner. And verse 12 articulates it in perfect fashion. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So on the surface, when we're referring to John 3.16, it may well appear that God will save everybody just because we accept Jesus Christ. And you hear how that's articulated. You can go to the mainstream Christian you know, TV shows and so forth. All you got to do is believe. Well, I think we have to look at what the term believe actually means. So that particular word is pisteo in, in, in Greek, and it means to commit. To commit, to obey, to trust, to become a believer. You know, Paul writes in Hebrews 9, 26 and 28, you don't have to turn there, but uh, that Christ gave himself once for all time for the remission of sin, and he doesn't have to sacrifice himself again. It took all he had. And he gave it to us. So if we carry on to John 3 and 31, dropping down to verse 31, I, I believe that we see who the true gift portion of this narrative is actually directed at. I don't want you to come away from here saying, oh, that Darren's up here blowing a lot of hot air. John 3, 31 says, He that comes from above is above all. Backing up what we just read. He's above all. And he that is of earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. And he that comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no man receives his testimony. He that has received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. Becoming a believer. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. And I think verse 35 and 36 here crystallize the point. The Father loves the Son and has given all things. All things. That's authority. That's truth. Into His hand. 
He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believes not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. And I think that explains what these two halves of John 3.16 are talking about. There is the world, and there is those that believe, those that commit, those that obey, and make their journey on having a relationship with Jesus Christ, God the Father. These are ominous words. You know, because I, I think the John's words here give us a different perspective. Everyone hearing God's words is confronted with a choice. We have a choice to make. Believe and obey it. Or take the chance of the alternative of not obeying and risking eternal death. Quite the opposite of what we're looking towards this time of the feast. And I'd encourage you to look at how much emphasis has been placed upon belief and commitment throughout what we've been reading here. We have to commit to this. This is a lifestyle. This is a way of life. This whole idea of repentance is not a one-time event. This has to be a lifestyle. We have to commit to a life of repentance. Because the world as a pool of individuals may have a God that sincerely does not wish for them to perish. We know that scripture too. And we're going to read that one shortly. However, God in keeping with his, his standard of who and what will and will not be present in his kingdom is making it crystal clear. We have our part to play. There's responsibility that is on us. This is a, I truly believe this, that Jesus Christ is not willing to waste his blood sacrifice on those unwilling to obey him. John 15 and verse 14, Christ says, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So what is commanded? Let's go over to 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. It says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. There it is. There's what's commanded of us. Repent. Clearly, a major component of this commitment that we are seeking to be part of is repentance. And I would submit again that this is quite different from what the mainstream is selling us. When you see hung over the bleachers in a hockey game or at a football game where it says John 3.16. Do they know what they're talking about? I think we know the answer. Because why did Jesus come? I have a litany of scriptures that can back up a few of these uh, points here that I'm going to make, but uh, you can get them from me later. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but we know that he came to fulfill prophecy. He came to seek and save the lost. I've said this a number of times before too. So much of our walk in this Christian lifestyle is so much less of us reaching up to God, but God reaching down to us. Thank God for that. I know in my case, I definitely needed God to be reaching down to me. Fifteen years ago, he'd asked me if I thought I'd be standing right here right now. Nope. We've all got our part to play. And he came to serve and give his life as a ransom. Again, I say, thank God for that. You read about that in Mark 10, 45. 
Matthew 20, verse 28. He came to reveal the Father and do the will of God. Thus setting forth this example that I'm talking about, this standard that God is trying to get across to us. We read of that in Matthew 11, John 14, Hebrews 10. And he came to bear witness to the truth as an extension of that. John 18, 37, where it says, For I, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I think this is so important. He's never stopped preaching the message, but oftentimes it's been us. We've stopped hearing. We've stopped listening. So much of what is so important in these scriptures, we've allowed to become muddy. And looking at the politics of one church group or another. Friends, we've got to drop that. We're all of the same body. We're all of the same body of Christ. He came to save sinners and to put away sin. We all probably heard quite a bit about that on atonement here that we just came through. 1 Timothy 1.15 Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But we need to admit it. We need to confess it and repent of it. Because at some point here, we have to become ex-sinners. Because ultimately, what we want, we want to live within the fulfillment of God's will. And part of that will of God is to see His children come into His kingdom. Part of why we are separating ourselves out from the world and taking this time off, taking the risks that we do with our jobs, a lot of cases, risks with our health to make this journey and come to the feast. And again, something that we would have probably heard plenty of on atonement here a few days back, that he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to bear our sins and to put Satan away. And to get into it, truly what I'm talking about today. 1 Peter 2.21 tells us that he came to provide a pattern of holy living. Something for every Christian to look to. It says, Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Mightily important, brethren. Because ultimately God sent His only begotten Son into this world so that mankind would have a means of being saved. So that mankind would have a means of entry into the kingdom that's pictured here at the Feast of Tabernacles. Luke 9.56 says, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Submit. We have our part to play so that that can become a reality. And we desperately need that to be a reality. But man has to become something that God wants to recognize. Not just that he will recognize, that he wants to recognize. And I'm sure we all saw that take shape as we went into the Day of Atonement. So, part of what we do here is to do what is commanded of us. We read that already in John 15. That you are my friends if you do so whatsoever I command you. So I'd say that, you know, an example of that, we'll just have a couple of examples here. There's many, many more, many more scriptures that one could go to, but I promise I wouldn't go long today. 
But an example of doing what Christ has commanded us, on top of that repentance that we just talked about, is exactly what we're doing here today. We're observing a Sabbath. We are here. The world is out there. Not knowing what we're doing. They don't get it. But by the grace of God, we've, we've, been, we've been taught. We've been shown. And it's only one example of many, for sure. But the observance uh, of a Sabbath, you know, even on the weekly Sabbath, sometimes that's, that's our first line of communication with somebody that's coming into, into the faith. That somebody that is just new to it shows up. Where do we see them the first time? Very often. It's on in the Sabbath service. So important. So important. Because it's one thing that we can recycle members in and through these various groups that I call it the alphabet soup of the Church of God groups. But how much more important is it that we get these folks from the outside that come in and want to be part of what we're doing? Well, start out by doing what Christ commands us. And those Sabbaths are very important. And that applies to all these feast days that are separated from the calendar that we have to come and observe on. Ezekiel 20, verse 12, verse 20. It says, Moreover, I have given them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. And verse 20 says, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they should be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And these words, sign and sanctify, it means to be set apart, to be consecrated, to be hallowed, to be a distinguishing mark banner a token or an ensign or a standard and through these scriptures I think we need to understand that we are purchased with a price and that's because God loved us that much that there is a responsibility on our part I know I sound like a broken record in this message about that. But we have a responsibility. A responsibility to believe, to commit, to love, to love God, to love one another. It wasn't suggested to us to love one another. It's commanded. Love one another as I have loved you commanded we need to obey and absorb we need that salvation by way of repentance and baptism but it means that we must not only conform to God through Jesus Christ but put it into action in our lives and this would be the other example I'd look to today we've only looked at Two so far. This will be the third one. But it's to pass it on. To teach what we know. In so doing, God makes his gifts available to that whole world that he loves. He chose us. He said he chooses us. Could have had his will done by stones, but he chose us. How thankful ought we be for that. So to pass it on, let's look at Matthew 28. Not treading any water that any of you haven't been through before. We know these scriptures. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, we'll read to verse 20. 
says, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So go you therefore, teach all nations, baptize them, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In some translations, it cuts that part out, but it says baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son for the remission of sins. And this is what's important. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Going back to what he has commanded us. What we need to do. And he says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The latter half of that verse 20 there is the encouragement that Christ knows we needed. He is with us. And that's the reason why we must understand true belief. Commitment. It's not a superficial concept, such as the mainstream would make popular, and that so many people have been deceived by. This is not a standalone scripture. As with most scriptures, it's not a standalone scripture. It has at least two parts in that statement. But in the context of all of John 3, I think it opens up a much larger spectrum of understanding and emphasis. That is to say, that God does indeed love the world. He does indeed want the best for his creation. But he will not accept sinful actions, sinful behavior, sinful lifestyle. We need to come out of that. He gave His Son in sacrifice that if we will humble ourselves, if we will obey Him, and as part of that belief, truly repent, truly believe, that we will by His grace receive the benefit of that sacrifice and live eternally with Him. And again, I submit, that's why we're here. We look forward to a time when we will live eternally with him.